just look at these ruins and rebuild it in your mind what Herod the Great's palace would have looked like. This would be the magnificent palace in Caesarea, the city that he built. Now there might be some other palaces for some other, you know, people who were ruling here, there, that come and do this, that, and the other thing. But if you're ever gonna say the palace in Caesarea, you're talking about this one, okay? Now, one of the important things that was found here, and this is a replica, of course, but this is the Pontius Pilate inscription. We'll see the real one in the Israel Museum, but understand that it was found here in Caesarea, okay? Now, what it is, is it's, uh, it's the Governor Pontius Pilate who is dedicating a temple to the Emperor Tiberius. When Herod the Great built this, he built, there's a huge tower over there, and then, um, and then we'll be going to this place that we were talking about, a one thing on top of another. He built the huge temple over there to Augustus. And Augustus is the first emperor of, uh, of the empire of Rome, Octavian, and, and it becomes Augustus Caesar. Okay, so what does that mean? It means in that temple, you worship the Caesar that is ruling the empire at the time, the living Caesar. So think about them worshiping Augustus Caesar at the time that Jesus is born. He was born during the reign of Augustus. And then the same thing was going on, we know from this inscription, uh, in Pontius Pilate had a temple built to worship the emperor in his day, Tiberius, who was the emperor of, Ro the, of Rome when Jesus was crucified. Okay, what's the charge? As the divine king. What are they worshiping the Caesar of Rome as? The divine king. See the imitation? But let's just take a little time to walk through these foundations that are left from the palace of Herod the Great. Now, Herod the Great built this palace then later, Pontius Pilate was also responsible ruling from here as the prefect, uh, the governor over Judea. So, so let me ask you this: If he's going to live here in Jerusalem, in uh, Caesar, Caesarea, where do you think he's going to live? He's going to live in this palace. Right. He's not going to live in some little dinky palace that somebody else built in Caesarea. He's going to live in this massive palace, palace that Herod the Great built. This is important. <laughs> this is an important point here in Caesarea because it's a very important point in Jerusalem. Herod the Great also built a palace in Jerusalem. And so when Pontius Pilate is up, most of the time he's, he's here, but when he's up in uh, Jerusalem, where do you think he's gonna stay? Petrine. The palace. He's gonna stay in the palace, Herod the Great's palace. You're going to see on this trip, Herod the Great never did anything yeah. small. Uh, he wasn't a great. He's a great. He wasn't a great wife, uh, husband. He wasn't a great father. father but he was a great builder. What is behind you here is now part of the city. This is, of course, the royal residency and everything that we were just at. Now this kind of mounded up area here has the houses underneath it. Now somewhere in Caesarea is the ruins of a church that's commemorating Cornelius' house. I mean, just knowing everything that's commemorated, this would definitely be commemorated by the church, but it hasn't been found yet. Okay, but there's 
like they were talking about these Bosnian houses that are, you know, a hundred years old. There, there's much still that needs to be removed to see what's underneath it. Now we're back to the Joppa Caesarea story. Now we're standing on the opposite side of that, looking back towards Joppa. Okay, and uh, in chapter uh, 10, um, verse 23, the next day Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day they arrived at Caesarea. Um, they go into Cornelius' house and uh, in verse 28, this is, what, this is what Peter says to them. So he's entered, he's gotten the three repeated visions He's now entered this unclean city, past all this unclean statuary, and probably pigs running around, and he's come to Cornelius' house, and, he's, uh, and now he's talking to these Gentiles. And uh, he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law. It's against our law. What I'm doing is against our law. For a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. Now you're starting to realize more why the, those visions needed to be repeated three times. Because he says this, But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Yeah. Right? And that's yeah. really what these visions were for, was to prepare for this moment. And, um, and so he's speaking with them. And what did, what did you call me here for? Well, and then and Cornelius tells him about this angel appearing to him. And, uh, and so, uh, what, what is Peter doing here in this Gentile house? He's there to deliver what? The gospel. The gospel, exactly. And so, verse 34, then Peter began to speak. So we just heard, going forward in time, we just heard uh, Paul over here giving the gospel. Now we're going back in time, and now we see Peter, which in our account is the first time that the gospel has come to this pagan city. And here he says, Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in, in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Now listen to what Peter is saying about him and his fellow apostles and Jews, we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but the witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives what we all so desperately need, the forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. See, this is like this is like the vision repeated three times. It's even more powerful than that. How are you going to argue with what God is doing when He's pouring out the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles? For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Okay, so think about that. We're going to be, later on in this trip, we'll be in Jerusalem, right? 
where the church was birthed. Where on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down on those 120 believers and, uh, and, and birthed the church. At that point, that church, with that, those 3,000 converts that would come through Peter's preaching, would, uh, was, was a Jewish church following, uh, following Yeshua as their Messiah, right? That's still the church that was expanding and growing uh, down in Joppa, as we read, through the resurrection of the dead down there of Dorcas. Uh, but now, this is the birth of the church for the Gentiles. Which is unique. Um, as it says here, down in chapter 11, well, if you look at <laughs> after all of this happens, right, then Peter has to explain his actions in chapter 11. Now he's got to go back to Jerusalem and explain to, to the Jewish <laughs> church uh, uh, what he was doing. And so he goes through and he retells a story. He tells uh, the story about the vision that he saw and what God's voice said to him, get up, eat or kill and eat. And, uh, and, and that he, what he said and that, uh, that God's voice said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So he goes through all that story. And then, uh, right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. And uh, the Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. And then he tells them the story about coming up here and what happens and the Holy Spirit being poured out on, on them. And listen to the reaction in verse 18. It says, When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, and Here's what all that we've discussed in regards to this in Joppa and here in Caesarea right now has to do with. Ready? So then, even to Gentile, even to Gentiles, God has re has granted repentance that leads to life. Thank God, or we wouldn't be here. <laughs> right? and, uh, and so, what an important place. What Jerusalem is to the um, Jewish believing church that was birthed there through the foundation of Christ and the apostles, this is for the Gentile church. And what an appropriate place as we stand on the Mediterranean and think what's out there. We've got, you know, uh, Italy out there, we've got Greece out there, we've got the world out there to which now that message that first started with the Jews and first started with. Jerusalem and then spread to Judea and Samaria is now come to the Gentiles and is going to go to the ends of the earth. And at this time, the Jews, the Jewish believers are the majority and the Gentile believers are the great minority, right? That's going to change real fast. Not for any other reason, but because it's supposed to. It's a, the message of good news is a message to the world. And how many Jews are living in the world compared to how many Gentiles are living in the world. And so if the message is going to go out by its power and people are going to come to salvation, wouldn't we expect the Gentile uh, all of a sudden to, um, to blast off into the majority? And, uh, and how could it be any different? So they're doing renovation on the on the theater. So we're gonna just we, we got a good view of the theater from here. We'll be seeing other uh, Roman theaters along the way. Just another Roman theater. <laughs> Actually, that's what it would be for us if it wasn't for Acts chapter 12. And so um, I'm gonna start reading in uh, verse 19, talking about Herod's death. Now this isn't Herod the Great now. This is uh, Herod the Great's grandson, Herod Agrippa the First. Okay, so we're kind of going more in the chronology, not of where we left Joppa, but in the chronology of as we're going from uh, site to site inside Caesarea. So it says this, Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace. 
because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. Most likely here at this uh, theater. Now again, this theater has been renovated and, and uh, over the years, but, um, but that, that theater from that time is part of the structure that you're looking there with many renovations into the fourth century. Uh, so uh, uh, he's addressing the public. Verse 22, they shouted, this is the voice of God not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. We're going to see this a lot on this trip. We're going to see God, our man, claiming to be divine. And then we're going to see the actual true divinity who became uh, a man in, as our Messiah. Okay, and so uh, the contrast of the two, whatever's going on in truth that God is doing, the enemy is always imitating yeah. down through history. And we're going to see that again and again and again. This was uh, King Agrippa bringing glory to himself. And, uh, and now we're going to see other parts and, and read other accounts here in this city of where uh, God is glorified. He's on trial between, in front of the rulers. You understand? That's the palace where the rulers hang out. And it's built right up against the back of this hippodrome so that this can be used also to serve uh, an audience for the palace. Does that make sense? And we have parallels from other Roman cities of, of uh, being built and designed the same way. And so it makes most sense that the account that I'm going to read uh, will, will take place here, took place here. So I'm in chapter 23 of Acts. Uh, verse 23, so Paul, the plot to kill Paul has happened, and now Paul is transferred to Caesarea. Then he called <clears throat> two of the centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. Think of that. Think of how that's 200 ho uh, soldiers, 200 more spearmen, and 70 horsemen. We're talking about 500 uh, in this military uh coming down here with Paul to go to Caesarea at 9 tonight and remember they're fasting until they're not going to eat until they kill Paul and, and all this is going on um, so he comes down here and we've got all these trials trial before Felix trial before Festus and the one that I want to uh, focus on is uh, the Paul before Agrippa the next day, Agrippa and, uh, and Bernice, now this would be then uh, Agrippa the second. Okay, the next day, this is uh, verse 23 of chapter 25. The, the, the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. Chapter 26, then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul is in chains, and, uh, and here's what he says. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. 
And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are, are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just, just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time, I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I have tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I, have, that I even hunted them down in the foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as, uh, and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray to God, that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. And then verse 32, Agrippa said to Festus, or th then the king rose with him, governor and Bernice. See, uh, well, he had already appealed to Caesar. And they say in verse 32, Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Of course, God's plan wasn't for him to be set free. God's plan was for him to take the message that we just heard him share here, the good news about who Jesus is, and take it to Rome. Which, remember, on the bluff over there where we'll go, there was a, what? first of all, by Herod the Great, a Roman temple, mm -hmm. right? To Augustus Caesar, and then what replaced that temple? What was the next building? Byzantine church. A church. At this time, when, uh, when this account is happening and this testimony is coming forth from Paul in chains, the temple is over there. In about 300 years, the gospel will so impact Rome that that temple to Augustus, where people are worshiping, the Caesar of Rome is going to change into a church Amen. where the people come to worship Jesus. That's good. The one whom Paul Amen. talks I love. about.
powerful stuff. It's in our Bibles, and it's in the evidence as well. Yeah. It's in the layout of the city, what happens. So think of this place and keep in mind that this, remember what Jesus, we're going to go over what Jesus says in Jerusalem when we're in Jerusalem. He tells them to take the word, right, to Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria, and then where? The uttermost parts of the world. Uttermost parts of the world. This is a major city here on the coast where it goes out and uh, to the uttermost parts of the world. And Paul, of course, is uh, one of the major mouthpieces as an apostle for which it goes out. Not the only one, but of course one of the major ones Amen. goes out to the Gentiles. I want to uh, read from uh, a letter writ by, written by Pliny the Younger, you've heard of him, okay, uh, to the Emperor Trajan. Okay, so we're talking about a letter that was written around 112 AD. Pliny the Younger is a governor of, uh, of, of a place called uh, Pythnia Pontus, which was up in what is today Turkey. Okay, and so, but it represents what was going on in all these places. Okay, so uh, here he is, he's trying to figure out, okay, what do we do with these Christians? Because they're starting to freak out about Christians because they keep multiplying. And if they don't do something about it, not only here, but in Rome, the, these temples are gonna turn into churches, right? So here's what he says. He's writing Trajan, he says, okay, it's my practice to refer to all matters concerning which I am in doubt. For who can better give guidance to my assistants or inform my ignorance? I have never participated in trials of Christians. He is now, but he's saying, I don't have any experience in this, now I'm having to do these trials of Christians. So that's what you are, you're on trial. That's your test. He says, I therefore do not know what offenses it is to practice, to punish or investigate, and to what extent, and I have not, and I have been not a little hesitant, or uh, as to whether there should be any distinction on account of age. Does Rachel get off the hook, or uh, no difference between the very young and the more mature? Whether pardon is to be granted for repentance, or if a man has once, uh, or if a man has once been a Christian, it does him no good to have ceased to be one. Whether the name itself, the name of Jesus. Uh, even without offense, offenses, or only the offenses associated with the name are to be punished. You just hold to that name, are you punished? You know, he's asking all these questions. Meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. So he says, this, this is the procedure that I've been following. So I'm going to tell you how I've been doing it, and I'm asking you if this is right. Okay, I interrogated the... Uh, I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians. Now one thing, thinking about, standing here, okay, look at all those people over there. Look at all those people over there, look at us, look at the... Can you tell by looking at people if they're Christians? Especially since it went to the Gentile church. Now the whole world uh, is, is, uh, can respond to the gospel. Can't tell. And did, did those... Did those uh, Gentiles who became Christians, did they stop eating things and start wearing things and to distinguish themselves from all those that they were living around? It's really, really hard to tell Christians by looking at them. It's impossible, actually. Sometimes okay. even in the church, it's hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the question then is, whether they're Christians or not. So they're going to ask them. Uh, you, 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 you gather, and this was done, in some periods it was done in isolated areas, and others it was, it, was, it was throughout the empire. They bring people systematically and ask, are you Christians? Are you Christians? Yes. yes. Uh-oh. Really? <laughs> Uh-oh. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second time. 
Are you Christians? Yes. yes. And a third time, yes. 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 threatening them with punishment. Did you see what happened to those ladies down there? Yeah. Did you see what happened to those men? The guy who had the vinegar poured on him? Did you see that? Are you sure that you're Christians? Those who persisted, I ordered executed. Those who denied that they were uh, that they were or had been Christians, when they invoked the gods and words dedicated to me, offered prayer with incense and wine to your image. Okay, so if you don't want to be tortured, if you don't want to be stripped down naked and thrown around on machines and have your limbs torn apart in front of a cheering crowd, this is what you got to do. You got to go over here to the imperial court, uh, the imperial uh, cult. And you got to sacrifice to the uh, to the emperor of Rome. You've got to worship him. It can be simple. You just take some incense and go like that, or maybe some wine and go like this. Pour it out in front of him. Bow. Show reverence. Worship. You willing to do that? which I ordered to be brought for this purpose together for the statues of the gods. So he brought wine and incense for this. Now, let's say you're not too keen on getting ripped into uh, pieces. So you say, okay, I'll just do that. Stage two, and moreover, you're to curse Christ. Here's why, uh, this is why he has this in his policy, none of which, those who are really Christians, it is said, can be forced to do. These, I thought, should be discharged. So if you claim to be a Christian three times, executed. The way to get out of your execution, if you said that you were a Christian, is you had to you had to worship the emperor in these specific ways, or, and in addition, you had to curse Christ out loud. Um, he goes on, he talks about some that he let go because, he says, they all worshiped your image and the statues of the gods and cursed Christ. So they got let go. He's talking about what a problem Christianity is. Listen to what he says. He says, this superstition, that's what he calls uh, Christianity, this superstition has spread not only to the cities, but also to the villages and the farms. They're everywhere. This is spreading like crazy. And so, um, hence it is easy to imagine that a multitude of people can be reformed if an opportunity for repentance is afforded. So this was the battle against the, the spread of Christianity uh, during this time. Trajan writes a letter back. We have it, he said, you observe proper procedure, my dear Pliny, in sifting the cases of those who had been denounced to you as Christians, for it is not possible to lay down any general rule to serve as a kind of fixed standard. If they are denounced and proved guilty, they are to be punished with this reservation. Uh, with this reservation that whoever denies that he is a Christian and really proves it that is by worshiping our gods even though he was under suspicion in the past shall obtain pardon through repentance okay and this is at the time of Trajan from the time of Trajan moving forward especially into the time of Diocletian it doesn't get better than this it gets much much worse so I think it's worth us, of course it's easy for us to say what we would do right now, yeah. Yeah. but it would be another matter if the situation were real, and, um, and it's very understandable how some did this, and that's what the ones who were forgiven and let back into the church uh, did. They, they both sacrificed to the emperor and they denied Christ. So it's humbling. It's humbling to to understand what Christians during this period faced, and it's important to understand.
because in some parts of the world, Christians still face it. And at some point in time, all Christians that are will face it again. I mean, it's it's not over what's going on here. It's it's still, as Jesus said, it's going to get worse as uh, as time goes by. Caesarea becomes a major, major place for the growth of Christianity. Makes sense, right? Two early church fathers that are very important to early church history are here in Caesarea. One of them is Origen. How many of you have heard of Origen, who started out in Alexandria down in Egypt, but then came here and taught at a school here? Okay, and so he lived here for a long time, and so we have Origen's accounts, for example. If you lived here, you're going to go to Bethlehem while you're living here. Well, Origen went to Bethlehem. So we have his early accounts in the third century to see where Jesus was born as one example. After Origen dies, not long after Origen dies, by the way, Origen was persecuted and tortured for his faith and died a few years after, but it was from the injuries that he suffered from that. And then we have Eusebius, often called the father of church history. If it wasn't for Eusebius, we wouldn't know an awful lot that we do because he sat here, ruling as a bishop here in Caesarea. He's in a library copying things down. And a lot of previous sources that he copied, we wouldn't know of if he hadn't copied them himself. Okay, and so uh, we have Eusebius, the church history, one of the writings here. And being a local of Caesarea, having his writings, I thought it would be interesting to look at some of the descriptions that he has. Now he's living here in the end of the third century and the beginning of the fourth century. Martyrdoms at Caesarea. So again, he's not writing as someone who's distant from these things. He's right in the heart of it. It says three prominent professors of Christ at Caesarea in Palestine were also crowned with martyrdom by becoming food for wild beasts. Then he gives their names, Priscus, Malchus, and Alexander. One thing we have to keep in mind here is another thing this Hippodrome was used for, and that was persecuting the early church. So imagine these seats full of people, not just cheering a chariot race, but cheering these three guys being torn to pieces by these wild animals. Here's another one of these. In Caesarea in Palestine, a guy named Marinus, honored with high rank in the army, so he's Roman, and also prominent through birth and wealth, was beheaded for his witness for Christ in the following way, and then it tells a story. This guy is just like Cornelius. He's part of the Roman military and high ranking and confessing Christ. And so it says, he was a Christian that did not sacrifice to the emperors. It says this came to light and the judge first asked what opinions Marinus held. And when he saw that he steadfastly confessed his Christianity, he granted him three hours to reconsider. So he goes off and reconsiders for three hours. He comes back. Just as he was returning, a herald announced that the time had expired and summoned him to the court. Standing before the judge, Dill showed greater fervor for his faith and was immediately led off to execution and so found fulfillment. This also happened. Under the aforementioned rulers and was brought into a public place as an order to sacrifice. When he refused, he was hoisted up naked and lashed with whips until he should give in. Since even this failed to bend him, they mixed salt with vinegar poured it over the lacerations of his body where the bones were already protruding. When he scorned these agonies too, a little brazier was applied, and the rest of his body was roasted by the fire as if meat for eating. Not all at once, lest he find too quick a release, but little by little. Still he clung immovably to his purpose and expired triumphantly in the middle of his tortures. Such was the martyrdom of one of the imperial servants who was truly worthy of his name.
Peter. Here's another one. Women were tied by one foot and swung high in the air, head downward by machines, their bodies totally naked without a stitch of clothing. The most shameful, cruel, and inhumane of all spectacles for onlookers. Others died fastened to trees. They bent down their strongest branches by machines, fastened one of the martyr's legs to each, and then let the branches fly back to their natural position, instantly tearing apart the limbs of their victims. This went on not for a few days, but for some whole years, sometimes 10 or more. At times more than 20 were put to death, or 30, or almost 60. At other times, a hundred men, women, and little children were condemned to a variety of punishments and killed in a single day. In that time, and between when Peter is here with Cornelius, between that time and when the temple becomes a church, we're talking about mass persecution throughout that time. It was by blood, right? that that transformation took place with the blood of Jesus, of course, as a foundation, but also the blood of many believers. When did that persecution end? It ended with Constantine. Constantine was already ruling the West at the time, but he won a fight, a decisive battle here for the East in 324 AD. And it was under Constantine that those persecutions finally came to an end. So, from, we'll call it, Peter and Cornelius to Constantine, a lot of persecution, a lot of blood.